We've been in this series called Rooted that we started just a couple weeks ago. And the whole idea is, it comes from this passage in Ephesians where it says, uh, let our roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And we want to do that spiritually in our faith. And this word rooted literally means to establish deeply and firmly. And that's what we want to have happen to our faith. We want to have these roots go down deep that we have this sense of nourishment from God, but also this sense of stability and strength from God. And so this weekend, we're going one step further and looking at how the Bible nourishes and establishes our, our roots of faith. So last Christmas, uh, as we were doing gifts and everything, uh, my third child, my son, uh, received a, a, a toolkit, one of these little super compact, you kind of slide it and it opens up and it's got all these different tools in it. And he received one of those for Christmas. And uh, I didn't think anything else about it. I'm not even really sure who bought it for him. It was probably us, but somebody bought it for him. And he had this really neat toolkit, you know, it was this really cool thing. Well, uh, just about two months ago, we moved my son to Sacramento to go finish school at Sac State. We got them all set up. We had to run to Ikea in Sacramento and buy a couple of little, you know, bookshelves, this little desk thing for him. And uh, so we're at his apartment and we're scrambling for tools, you know, trying to put this thing together. And it's like, well, do you have this? No, nah, I don't have that. And so we're kind of rummaging around and finally get some tools together and we get everything set up. Well, I came home and we're turning his old room into a guest room. I mean, he was barely out the door and we started rearranging stuff, you know, moving his stuff out. You know, he had already done that. And so I'm setting it up as a guest room and I, I go into the closet and we have these built-in shelves in there. And on his shelves, he's left some stuff. And one of them is this toolkit, unopened, sitting on the shelf. And I'm thinking, well, that's not doing any good for anybody, right? Tools just sitting there unopened. I mean, it's still, still got the wrapper on it and everything. Just this toolkit sitting on the shelf. And I'm thinking, ah, what a waste. But as I was thinking about this weekend, it kind of reminded me of what we do with the Bible sometimes. It sits on a shelf, unopened, unread. And then we go through struggles, right? We go through circumstances and situations and we keep trying to find the right tools to fix our problems. We keep trying to, to figure out how's that gonna happen. So we're looking for tools in life and the toolkit is right there. We just never open it. And we come here on weekends and we hear someone talk about the tools, right? We... We see all kinds of things about them, but we just never open it up and get the tools for ourselves. And that's really, in one sense, what the Bible is. So why talk about the Bible? Well, the Bible is God's gift to us. We have a God who is intimately involved in and concerned about our lives. And because of his love for us, he wants the best for us. He tells us that in his word. And he's provided this life map for us, which is the Bible. Now, you're going to hear me call it different things tonight. Um, I've got all my sticky notes in here. But uh, we call it a Bible. We call it God's word. We call it scripture. So we call it different kinds of things. But, it, but it's all the same things. It is... God's message, his letter of life for us. And everything you need to know to honor him, to know him, to please him is found in this Bible. And if we follow his words and if we take his message to heart, we can experience his provision and his experience and, and, and we can understand his strength in that. We can we can kind of lean in close to his presence. Everything we need right here. By the way, our need is not in knowledge, though we're gonna get that. And our need is not a code or a specific instruction. Our need in this is him. We need God. And how we begin to discover and find and experience him more is through his word. 
Now, I've heard this acronym for the Bible. In fact, I think someone turned it into a song a few years ago. But you take the, the, the B-I-B-L-E, the word for Bible, and someone said it stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. Have you heard this? Basic instructions before leaving earth. And I gotta tell you, I think that is really pretty creative. And I will tell you this as well. While it is true, it's not even close to the whole story. Because this isn't just an instruction manual. It's not just a list of how-tos. It, it's an invitation. Again, not just for instructions, but to know the one who made the instructions. It's not just so that we can know about creation. It's so that we can know the creator. So if you're there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want to read you a few verses starting at verse 14. And the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to a young man who was leading a, a group of fellow believers to grow deeper in their faith. And here's what he writes to them. He says, but you must remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom, listen to this, to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, if you've been around the church or that passage is somewhat familiar to you, it's probably because you've heard the part how God's word is useful to teach us and correct us and those kinds of things. You've heard that. You might not have heard the first part because I don't know if you caught those phrases where it says this, that in this we receive wisdom to receive salvation. By the way, that's not about a theological concept. It's about knowing the Savior. It's about knowing Jesus. And it says we do this by trusting Jesus Christ. That's personal. That's up close. That's not a textbook. It's not a history book. It's a letter to us. Now, that passage goes on to say that it teaches, corrects, and prepares us and equips us. And I like that. And that's usually how we come to the Bible, to be prepared and equipped. But it starts by saying that all scripture, this entire Bible, is inspired by God. Now the actual word there literally has to do with breath. That this, this Bible that we read is inspired, it's like it's, it's breathed by God. It's his breath and his life that is contained in here. And then it says that this word teaches us what is true. Now Jesus says that he was and is the way and the truth and the life. So understand this, God's word, the Bible, is bringing us to Jesus. Not just some facts about his life, but bringing us to Jesus. So tonight, I wanna come at this from a different perspective, maybe for you. You see, we can know some things about the Bible. In fact, I'll give you a little background. The Bible is made up of 66 books and letters, making one complete whole. That's why when we say, you know, turn to 1 Timothy, that's one of the letters that's contained in these 66 whole that we call the Bible. But there are so many different kinds of writing in here. There's history, there's actual law, there's poetry, there's musical lyrics, there are personal letters and letters sent to a community at large. There are prophetic writings, there is apocalyptic writing, which is kind of writings about the end of things. There are symbols and metaphors as well as biographies. There are adventure journals and there's romantic love letters. The Bible was written over a 1600 year period by 40 different writers. Think about it. They came from every walk of life. In here are things written by kings and peasants, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, and scholars. It was written in all kinds of places. Some of this was written out in the wilderness. Some of it was written in dungeons and in prison, in palaces, while traveling. Some of it was written on a lonely isle, and some of it was written right in the midst of war. It was written over 
uh, a location of three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, yet the Bible carries this unmistakable thread of continuity all throughout its pages. Its internal consistency and its theme, even though written, again, over 1,600 years and 40 different writers, is absolutely stunning that they catch the same thread and the same theme over and over and over again. But here's the question for us. That's great information, right? It may even go, maybe you're, you're sitting here going, I didn't even know some of those things. I, I didn't know those facts about it. That's great. I hope you can learn even more. But the question is, what do we do with it? What do we do with it? Do we simply start on page one like we do every other book and read all the way to the end? Maybe. Maybe. But there are different times and there are different seasons for life, right? Different places in your life and in mine, different places of growth and maturity. And God's word has something for each of those seasons and for each of those places that we find ourselves in, in life. So maybe think about it this way. If you wanted to get in shape, if you wanted to get more physically active, what would you do? Some of you, some of you would start walking a little bit every day. Some of you would, would join a gym, right? And then feel guilty every time you drove by the gym, right? In fact, you'd find a different way home because you just don't want to go by the gym because you're not going there in the morning. I know. Some of you would get a fitness DVD and you would, you would start working out at home. Some of you would get a fitness app on your, on your phone or your iPad and it would motivate you and instruct you to do certain things. And that. Some of you would join a fitness boot camp you know, they have some of those and you'd show up at a local park at 5 a.m. and you'd do push-ups and carry buckets of sand while someone yells at you. You'd do that. It's awesome. And you'd pay someone to do that for you. It's remarkable how much you can lose weight and get in shape when someone's yelling at you. Some of you would start running. Some of you would swim. Some of you would hit weights. I think you get it. You would do different things to bring about different results. You will pursue different things to get in shape based on your age, your current fitness, your time, your family dynamics, your personal motivation. You try all different kinds of things. Can I tell you this? God's word is the same. It is powerful and it is deep. And God's word invites us, whatever our season in life, whether we're strong in our faith or, or maybe we even have a lack of faith, to step into his word and to get closer but God's word will accomplish different things and touch us in different ways. Let me read one last passage and then we're gonna dive into a couple things to fill in. King Solomon wrote this. He said, tune your ears to, to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He's a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the paths of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. Then you will understand what is right, just, and fair, and you will find the right way to go. Solomon talks about this wisdom that we get to have. And he says, as you begin to lean into this, there's, there's this understanding that comes. And we always think understanding is gonna be an aha moment when we know something more. But sometimes understanding is actually knowing in here. It is relationship oriented. And Solomon is saying, come and find out more. So I'm gonna give you these three things. I want you to write these down today. The first is this. The Bible is an invitation to know God more. The Bible is an invitation to know God more. Now, here's the deal. Understanding God fully is impossible. He's, he's beyond our scope. He's beyond our wisdom. He's beyond what we can fully comprehend. In fact, in Job 36, it says this. Look, God is greater than we can understand. His years cannot be counted. We simply can't figure all that out. He's beyond that. However, simply because he's beyond fully understanding doesn't mean that we should avoid the subject altogether. Doesn't mean we should go, well, I just can't know God. That's not it at all. We just can't know him fully. 
Because God has made many of his traits and many of his characteristics understandable, but also approachable for us. He's revealed himself to us through the Bible. And by reading and studying his message, his letter of life, we begin to learn who he is. And we begin to learn how he responds. And we begin to have greater understanding of what he's really like. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I wrote down a whole list of things. And, and this list is by no means exhaustive. In fact, it's a pretty short list. But I, I actually, this week, I sat down with a couple of our staff and said, should I put this in our program or should I just talk about it? And we all was like, no, let's put it in there. Because I want you to take these home, this whole list of things. And maybe you're going to look up some of these verses and have a new understanding of who God is. But let me just walk through them. The Bible says that he's the father who truly knows best. Now, there was a show way, way back in the 50s called what? Father Father Knows Best, right? He knows nothing compared to our heavenly father, right? We have a father who truly does know the best way to go. He knows the decisions for us to move in. He has a way for us to live and we can trust him in this. God also knows no boundaries and he's without measure. Some of these I'm just gonna read. God is in control of everything that happens. Do you know that? Now, some of you are going, whoa, 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 wait, wait, because I've been facing some really hard things in that. Got it. Not everything that happens is God's will for us, but he is not out of control when it comes to life. Do you know that there is absolutely no sin or evil in God at all? He is all love, he is all good, he is all kindness, and his intentions towards us are good. God knows everything, and his knowledge is infinite. God, everything that God has promised will come to pass. It may not be in your or my timing, but everything that he has promised will come. Here's the next one you probably need to circle. God loves us deeply and firmly, and nothing can change that. That's the whole idea behind the song we sang, The Reckless Love, is that there's nothing he won't do to come after you. And I don't mean that in a I'm coming after you kind of a thing. I mean, he loves us so much, nothing will stop him from extending that love to us. He is all powerful. He has no beginning or end. He just exists. He is fair and impartial. He never changes God has always been and always will be. God by nature is good. How often? And all the time, God is good, right? We know that. God enjoys giving good gifts to those who love him. God is always present and he knows no boundaries. So we begin to look at this list and as you begin to read through the Bible, you begin to understand God more and more. So how can we begin to understand these things? One of the ways that we do that And I want you just to dial in right here, okay? Because I'm going to give you several practical things. One of the ways we do that is to read through the entire Bible. You begin to see the big picture. You begin to see the scope of God's majesty and God's love. There's a reason for the poetry. There's a reason for the history. There's a reason and a purpose for the book of Leviticus. When you get there, you'll know. There's a reason for the law. There's a reason for numbers. There's a reason for the genealogies that you read. There's purpose behind those things. Reading the entire Bible over a year or two will change your life. I'll tell you, it'll take you about 15 minutes a day to read it through in about one year. 15 minutes a day. And I'm not gonna get, kid you, there will be times when you're reading through the Bible and you're gonna, you're gonna stop and you're gonna go, what is going on? Okay, because you're gonna get to places and it's just gonna seem like, I, I don't get this at all. You're gonna read in the book of Leviticus about what to do when there's mold on the bricks of your house. And you're going, oh, hang on a second here. Like, what does this have to do with how I'm living my life? I mean, there's gonna be some things that you stop and think about. Can I tell you what I would keep in mind when you read through that stuff where it's all of these rituals and things you have to do? How many people knew about bacteria and microorganisms back then? Nobody. <coughs> And God set up a way to keep his people healthy and safe, even though they didn't know what was happening at a molecular level. Talk about a God who cares. 
Now we read through it and all we think is like, oh, this is a waste of time. But back up a little bit and see the bigger picture of what's going on. And reading through the Bible, even if you don't understand certain places, there's gonna be times when you do and you're gonna be convicted in your own heart and by your own actions. There will be times when you are comforted, when you're going through something hard and you're gonna read some place in Psalms where, where David is crying out and God responds to that and you're gonna take that and you're gonna own it because it's gonna like, man, God is right here. There will be times when, when you're gonna grow in your understanding of who God is and what he's like and his intentions towards us. And it happens when you begin to see the ebb and flow and the scope of the entire Bible. And if you've never read through the entire Bible, do it, try it, take a step, commit yourself for a year that you're gonna do this and watch what happens by the end. Write this down for number two. The Bible is an invitation to follow Jesus closely. The Bible is an invitation to follow Jesus closely. Over 20 times in the accounts of Jesus, he says this, follow me. Follow me. Now, many of these times, Jesus was calling those 12 who would become his disciples. But other times when he says, follow me, he's speaking to anyone who wanted what he had to offer. Guess what? That's me and you. He says, follow me. Follow me. And Jesus spoke words of truth and grace. Now, Jesus never softened the truth. And the truth is, is that following him will often lead us to difficult choices. Sometimes in those difficult choices, turning back seems like a much easier way. And I will tell you, it is for a while. When Jesus' teaching went from the Sermon on the Mount on that hillside, all the way a few years later to his teaching leading up to the cross, many who had followed him said, I can't go there with you, man. That's too hard. That's too countercultural. It's too radical. It costs too much. You're asking for too much in this. And they turned away. To truly follow Jesus means that he becomes everything to us. Now, the truth is, is that we all follow something or someone, right? Friends, culture, family, our own selfish desires, or maybe we do follow God. Jesus told us that you can only follow one thing at a time. In the book of Luke chapter nine, Jesus said this, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. It's an upside down thing, isn't it? He says, man, when you really hang on tight, you're gonna end up losing everything you're hanging on tight to. But if you will give up your life to me, you will actually find life. And he says, the way you do that is you give up your own way. You take up your cross daily, which is surrendering. And like, I'm crucifying me. I, I'm not in control anymore. And he says, and you follow me. Following him means you take the steps to be like him. Jesus always obeyed his father, so that's what I desire to do. To follow Christ means we make him our leader, and that's what it means to make Jesus Lord of our lives, that every decision, every dream is filtered through his word with the goal of putting him first in everything. Because see, the thing is, we're not saved by the things we do for Jesus, but what he has already done for us. Because of his grace, we want to please him in everything. And all this is accomplished as we allow the Holy Spirit to have complete control of every area of our life. Let me say that again. It's accomplished as we allow the Holy Spirit to have complete control of every area of our life. Our relationships and our family and our work and our school and our finances and our our sexuality, and I mean, all these, you can keep going through the list, like, ah, but I, I, I'm gonna manage that one. Jesus said, will you come and follow me and surrender it all to know me? 
He explains the scriptures, empowers us with spiritual gifts, comforts us and guides us. John 14 says this, but when the Father sends his Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Following Jesus means we apply the truth we learn from his, lie, his word and live as if he walks beside us. Now here are some of the ways that we can read the Bible from a different way, from a different place and learn to follow. And it's simply to take some time and just to read and study about Jesus. Now, let me say, I'm not asking you to do all these things at the same time. If you've never read through the Bible, read through the Bible. But some of you have read through the Bible once or twice or more. And can I tell you something? Try a new way. You can go back to that. But try something new for a season where you just take time and read and study about Jesus. Those first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is an invitation to follow, to see God lived out in human form, how he responds and lives and loves. Take your time, go slow, look deeply, and see for yourself who Jesus is and make the choice when he says, come and follow me. So last week I shared with you when I was on my sabbatical and I had gone up to that cabin and got snowed in at this cabin. And so one of the things I did was I set aside all of the normal things that I would maybe do in a quiet time or in any of that. And I just, I wanted to do something new. And so I have gone through those gospels, those Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John many times. I've done it with our men's Bible study. I've done those kind of verse by verse. And that's so good. And you can really squeeze so much out of that. We're gonna talk about it in just a moment. But what I did while I was there is I took time and I, I read through the entire book of Matthew just in one sitting. It doesn't take all that long. And just, just saw the whole thing play out. And the next day I read through the book of Mark and I, and I just saw the whole scope of Jesus laid out from a different perspective. And I just kind of zeroed in on Jesus and what it meant to follow after him. And for some of you who have found yourself in a rut, maybe just, yeah, I read the Bible, I just go through and, and, and here's when you know you're in a rut, you get done because you're trying to like read through or, or whatever it might be, I'm going to read a chapter or two or three a day and you read through and you put it away and you go, okay, done, check that off my list. And if I was to talk to you five minutes later and say, well, what did you read today? You'd go, well, something, and it was like. It's about God, I know. You know, it's like we're, we're reading to read like we're, we should and we're supposed to and we get into that mode and we, we, stop, we stop connecting with God and we simply read a history book and he's inviting us into something more. Write this down for the last one. The Bible is an invitation to experience God deeply. There's nothing quite like experiencing God's presence. Not just facts about him, but experiencing him. And it's only when we are with God that there's truly this fullness of life. And while access is given to us freely now through Christ, we have a part to play in coming to his throne to experience him. Now that may be very religious language to you, but the Bible talks about coming to his presence. Now that's not a place you go. It's not a location. It's, it's an internal work of the soul that I come and say, God, I want you, I need you. I lean in close to him. Last week, if you weren't here, uh, go watch it or listen to it. We talked about listening to God and coming to those quiet places. But we have to come to that place to experience it. Why is that? Because though God is everywhere, we're not always seeking and listening. Most of the times we're too busy to stop and be with God, even though he's already with us. The Bible even says that Jesus' name is Emmanuel, which means God with us, but are we with him? Like he's not going anywhere, but sometimes we've just kind of tuned him out. It reminds me of how it is sometimes, uh, my grandson is about 18 months old, and when he has a toy, or heaven help us, if he gets a hold of the remote or one of our phones, like all bets are off at that point, he can sometimes forget that I exist, even though I'm sitting right there with him, because he's so engrossed in, you know, whatever it is, he's hitting all the buttons on the phone, and he just forgets everyone else in the room. Now, we kind of laugh it off, because it is pretty funny, but you know what? We can sometimes be that way with God's presence. 
He's with us. We just don't acknowledge it. He's there. We've just tuned him out. I'm gonna remind you of what it says in Psalm 46. I shared this last week. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. This is where we stop reading for facts and we start reading for friendship. We stop reading for, for time and we, we read to listen and to know. And this is where the Bible comes alive. It's no longer rules and regulations, but it's now rooted in love and driven by faith. It's no longer do this and do that, but instead personal words of encouragement grounded in love for you and for me. You're inspired to grow deep in this relationship with God. Psalm 16 says this, you will show me the way of life, granting me joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Let me read that again. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. That's experiencing him. So what does reading God's word look like in a season like this in your life? Maybe it's taking just a few verses and I came across this phrase recently, I love it, and squeezing the sponge, you know? Just like you would wring out a sponge to get all the water out. Maybe this is a season where you take just a few verses and you really dig deep and you just squeeze out everything. You squeeze out meaning and understanding and joy and strength. You're not trying to get through two chapters. Maybe you're just focusing in on two verses. See, there's no rules in this. The purpose is to experience God. Maybe you even take a characteristic and you discover all of God's heart in it. What does God say about joy? What does the Bible say about peace? What does the Bible say about the condition of my heart? You dig deep, not just for facts and information, but to experience God in the midst of this. So my challenge for you this week is to go to the Bible, to go to God's word, okay? You're gonna take it this week, whether it's digital or paper, however you wanna do it. And I would challenge you with some things. For some of you, if you haven't read through the Bible, to get the scope of God's purpose and plan and his character and his life. If you, if you haven't seen the whole picture, it, it's hard to just have a diet of just taking two verses and squeezing it out. You need to see the whole thing. So for some of you, this is the beginning of a journey to read through the Bible. For some of you, maybe this is your season to narrow down to Jesus and to look deeply at his words and his actions. Following Jesus will take on a whole new look in you. For some of you, this is the season as you've been through other things and maybe you find yourself just kind of blocked, kind of like you've hit the wall. And maybe this is the season for you to squeeze the sponge and wring every last drop out of a few verses to let your roots grow down deep into dis experiencing him and discovering what joy is and surrender and grace. His letter is for you, but it looks different in different seasons of life. There's no, there's no rules to this. There's no checklist. This is where we go to let our roots grow down deep. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you today for your word. That you didn't just call us and then dismiss us. You didn't, you didn't just call us and then say, well, just obey this set of rules or regulations. But Lord, you've invited us into a relationship. You've invited us into something deeper. And your words give us hope. Your words give us freedom. Your words show us who you are and how to follow you. But in all of that, Lord, it's not just instructions. It's to know you, to experience you, to find you and follow you. So we thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for the nourishment that it is to us. 
Thank you for the hope that it brings. Thank you that we get to see you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you